Please welcome to the stage, Richard Tice. Incapable negotiators, 
and MPs, even as we speak, trying to do dirty, dodgy, backroom deals with each other, completely against what they promised us in their manifestos. The truth is, these MPs seem happy to sell us down the river in the worst deal ever in history. That's what this proposed treaty is. It's the worst deal ever in history. And our civil servants have shown themselves to be utterly incompetent, simply not up to the job. So we say, enough is enough. This country deserves so much better. That's why we launched the Brexit Party. We knew that what this country needs is competent, capable, common sense policy. It's no longer a question of left or right. It's about right or wrong. It's as simple as that. Be yeah. under no illusion. We've got to take on the vested interests of the establishment. We've got to take on the multinationals and the lobbyists like the CBI, we've got to take on and reform the civil service so that our country is properly run and properly governed for the people, not for the establishment. That is our objective. We are here, ladies and gentlemen, be under no illusion to change politics for good. The two-party system is broken. It has completely and utterly failed us, the people and it's got to change. That's what we stand for. And we've had a pretty good reception in the last five weeks looking at the polls, but the big poll, of course, is this Thursday. And we need all of you, please, tell your family, tell your friends, your friends and friends, we've got to get out of the boat. We've got to win this, and ladies and gentlemen, we've got to win it big. Really, really well. <laughs> And this is really important. 
is that we believe, and we do not believe, that some of our elected MEPs form part, a significant role, in the future negotiating team. Because they've got the track record, the experience, the wisdom, and the belief in what they're negotiating for. Unlike the civil servants, they never believe in what they're negotiating for. Negotiating for. So surprise, surprise, they did an utterly useless job. So that is the second demand, as well as the damage here Brexit. We need to send that very clear message back to Westminster. And ladies and gentlemen, we know that we have confidence in this great nation. Do we believe in Britain? Yes! We're we quite sure? Yes! Do we believe in democracy? Yes! Does Theresa May believe in democracy? No! And there's a sense of desperation in the air from the opponents of Brexit, isn't there? Those determined to water down and overturn our democratic vote. Well, they are doling out insults and abuse, coming at us fast and furious with a kind of shrill, conspiratorial, wild, fantastical accusations and vile muckraking. They are in danger of debasing public life. One Guardian journalist describing the atmosphere of a rally much like this in Yorkshire last week said it was the blitz spirit wrapped up into a whipped up into a lynch mob. A lynch mob. What a vile, horrible sentiment. It's tempting to lash out. It's tempting, but we will not resort to their tactics. It's fantastic to see here, throughout the country and even on social media, that Brexit Party candidates and supporters alike are rising above this muckraking. I quoted before Michelle Obama's advice, they go low, we go high. So now again, as they go even lower, we must go even higher. We aren't... We aren't the types to play the woe is me victim card. We need to hold our nerve and our dignity and carry on making our positive case for democratic change, whatever they throw at us. But there is one insult that does need to be taken on head on. It is the disgraceful labelling of the Brexit party as far right and bigots. In a series of online Labour Party adverts under the heading Don't Let Fear Win, the Labour Party have actually whipped up fear. It's despicable when Jeremy Corbyn repeats a slur in the North West in Merseyside and on Andrew Marr's show that accuse the Brexit Party of attacking minorities and dividing society. This is Project Fear, 
outright lies. I can't imagine anything more divisive than accusing all of those millions of Corbyn's own Labour voters, many active anti-racists and anti-fascists, of being bigots. Of all those people from ethnic minorities who voted Leave, imagine accusing them of being far right. What is really divisive and indeed bigoted is to write off 17.4 million voters as beyond the pale. They are treating they are treating us as some sort of enemy within. But the Brexit party is the opposite. It is not dividing the country. Actually, in these elections, the Brexit party is the vehicle for uniting the country around defence of democracy. In my campaigning, I have met military, ex-military, united with anti-militarists fighting for democracy. Muslims, Jews, Christians, Sikhs, all religions and none. Traditional Labour and Conservative voters, even Lib Dems and Greens. And many, many remain Democrats and growing. All of us are united around democracy. Young and old, plumbers and philosophers, across social classes and educational divide. The Brexit Party is uniting the country, not dividing it. Our opponents don't get it because this is an actual breakout from the usual tribal group think that they're associated with. There are far right and racists existing in, in the UK, small minority, and I tell you now, I oppose them with every fibre in my body. But to brand to brand millions of people who straightforwardly demand that their vote is counted and not trashed as far right, well, and, and to brand people who enthusiastically are interested in rejuvenating democracy, well, I'll tell you what that is, that's real bigotry. In my book, I find that offensive about free speech, as Richard mentioned. I wrote about how this promiscuous use of labels such as far right, fascist, Nazi, etc., are used to delegitimise opponents. That means that Corbyn's Labour Party or Lib Dems or Heseltine and Remain Tories, when they use those labels, they are basically complacently refusing to bother engaging with us. They are lazily trying to silence and shun and discredit arguments without even having to win a political discussion. And I think that we should recognise that we are better than that. We have the arguments. They are lazy smearers. When Labour Party adverts say, when Labour Party adverts say, don't let fear win though, they're right. We shouldn't let fear win. Fear is a cheap political tactic. But we, we in this room know that, don't we? Because Project Fear has been tried on us before. It didn't work then and it shouldn't work again. We are the ones, we are the ones who optimistically embrace the challenge of a new political, social and democratic arrangement post-Brexit. It's our opponents who are the risk-averse pessimists who see any challenge to the status quo as scary. We're brave, they're scared, we're not going to be put off by Project Fear. When technocratic Remain MPs or terrified sections of the Liberal media describe this movement and these these rallies as far right or populist. Remember, it's because for those in the old decaying mainstream parties, they're just so unpopular, they don't recognise what a popular movement actually looks like. <laughs> of course they say, of course they say that big rallies like this are just uniting around democracy. And they're just saying the word democracy is oversimplistic, a slogan, a soundbite. They say we lack nuance, that we underestimate complexity of democracy. Well, who are they kidding? Democracy is not just a word for us. It's built on a rich seam of history and philosophy. It's built on enlightenment ideas of equality, liberty, freedom of association, freedom of conscience,
politicians, free speech, we understand that. Democracy is not just a soundbite for us. If you think that, then go try reading John Locke, Milton, Tom Paine. But it's not just a historical concept either. We, in this historic moment, need to make democracy our own again and to use these EU elections to kickstart a national democratic discussion throughout the UK. And I want to quote you a great Labour Party icon and socialist, Eurosceptic Tony Benn. He said this about democracy. If you don't keep up the pressure for democratic control, you lose it. It's use it or lose it. There is never a final democracy, a victory for democracy. It's always a struggle in every generation. And you have to take up the cause time and time and time again. Tony Benn is right. But this is our time to take up the cudgels for democracy. It's also going to have to cry for freedom. It's not a slogan. We're going to start by making history, by actually starting a great, fantastic, deep democratic debate. To finish, there's a wonderful mood, I think, of democratic liberty in the air. All the street stalls and rallies and meetings I've been at today out all over Salford, fantastic discussions going on, a real thirst for proper, principled politics, open-minded debates and discussions on new ideas. Those who say, where's your manifesto? Listen, the Brexit party's been clear. There's an exciting project after the European elections about what that manifesto will contain. But for now, the mainstream parties in this area all have manifestos. The thing is, they're betraying them. All the candidates of the Labour Party and the Tories are selling them out. What's more, there is absolutely no point debating and discussing manifestos and choosing different options and for society if the basic cornerstone of decision making is torn to shreds by Parliament and hollowed out by Parliament clinging on to the anti-democratic EU's coattails. When we start writing a manifesto, we'll do it by arguing and having democracy. And that's a good thing because we're the Democrats. So. Let's give democracy for our generation a huge boost on May the 23rd. We should not take one vote for granted. We need to win each and every X in the Brexit ballot, uh, party box on that ballot paper. So right till the end, you need to keep discussing and arguing with friends and neighbours and everyone. I'm rushing off now, I'm not wanting to be rude, because I'm speaking in Preston at another local Brexit party event. And I'd like to give a shout out to Nadine, who organised the event on her birthday. I mean, that's dedication for you, as is all the thousands of volunteers, the thousands of volunteers who have been out on the streets arguing for our votes and will continue to do so for the next four days. I salute you. And I want to finish with a quote from one of my heroines, the socialist suffragette Sylvia Pankhurst, who said, To the fool who cries democracy can do nothing, we answer, all the best of life today has been fashioned by and through democracy. Too right, Sylvia, and we're no fools. We know that all the best in life tomorrow and in the future relies on us today fighting for democracy. Vote Brexit Party, and yes, the best is yet to come. Thank you very much, everyone. Mr. Starr, thank you, Claire. She's so courageous, a true, passionate believer in democracy. And we all know, ladies and gentlemen, that completely contrary to what the other parties have been doing and saying, they viewed Brexit as a problem to be mitigated. Whereas we all know that actually Brexit is an opportunity to be grasped, it should be embraced 
with aspiration, ambition, enthusiasm, optimism, confidence and belief because we are an incredible nation. And I mentioned earlier about some of the business people that have been prepared to put their head above the parapet, to stand up for democracy, but also to know that actually this country should be run so much better. And the next speaker, he is someone, he's an entrepreneur from the world of technology, from the world of property. He knows how to negotiate deals. He is just the sort of person that we should be putting in to the future negotiations against Brussels. So please give a huge welcome to the stage, AJ Jagota. Please welcome to the stage, AJ Jagota. Technology, and you should have bought paper. <laughs> <clears throat> so, hello, fellow Brexiteers. It feels great to be here in Bolton. But you know what? I'm feeling excited. I'm feeling energized. And I'm so looking forward to Thursday. Are you? Are you? Good. First, let me thank you for all here and all those watching on live stream for the fantastic support you have all shown all of us candidates. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, my name is AJ Jagota. As, uh, as Richard has said, I've created businesses in various sectors over the past 25 years. My parents came to Britain from India in the 1950s. I come from a working class family. My mother worked in a factory, and my father working as a coal miner for 40 years. I've always been so grateful for the opportunities made available to me in this great country. Now, both my parents are lifelong Labour supporters. So imagine their surprise as their only son join the Conservative Party. <laughs> but then imagine their shock when I was elected chairman of my local association. Oh, they were not happy. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, in January, I resigned. <laughs> Frankly, I had had enough. But why had I come to this conclusion? Some of you may ask. But you may recall in 2016, we had a referendum. They asked us to vote. Let's go through what happened in that referendum. 16.1 million of us, of them, voted to remain while 17.4 million of us voted to leave. Yeah. 242 constituencies voted to remain. But my friends, 406 constituencies voted to leave. Yeah. Three. Yes, only three regions voted to remain. But like this region here, nine voted to leave. So, 
all looking really good so far. So like many of you, I believed we'd won the argument and we were set to leave. But my friend, in a faraway place called Westminster, there's a group, you might have heard of them, they call themselves MPs. They, in direct contrast to you, the people, they voted 160 to leave, whilst 486 of them voted to remain. And for the last three years, they have done everything, absolutely everything, to thwart that result. That is why I decided to stand for the Brexit party. <laughs> together, together my friends, we stand for democracy and together we can change politics for the good. Friend, but let's remind us what is broken in this two-party system and what have they given us thus far? Oh no, 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 no. Let's be fair. You have to be fair to these people, because they're watching. <laughs> oh yes, they're watching. So what did they give us? They gave us this, my friend, for Brexit. They gave us nothing but fudge. <laughs> and I would like you to join in with me. Let's go through those people. What has the Conservative Party given us? Fudge. What has Theresa May given us? Fudge. What has the Labour Party given us? Fudge. And what has Jeremy Corbyn given us? Fudge. And what are they trying to do now? No, no, my friend. No, no. Again, let's be fair. So Theresa May has gone from giving us a finger of fudge She's now working on giving us a box full of fudge. But I don't know about you. I've had enough fudge for the last three years to last me a lifetime. <clears throat> so my friends, we need to send a message loud and clear this Thursday to those in that faraway place in Westminster. We need to tell them, no more fudge. We've had enough. We've had enough of the old politicians, and we've had enough of the old politics. Just remember this as well. Over 80% of our MPs triggered Article 50, in which the legislation stated clearly we would leave with or without a deal. So, I have a question for them. Did they not know what they were voting for? <laughs> we need your help to win on Thursday. We need to ensure we win for democracy. So on Thursday, there's only one party in town, and that's the Brexit Party. Thank you. Thank you. Not only a great entrepreneur, but also an inspirational speaker. AJ, thank you very much indeed. The courage and bravery that you've shown, putting your head above the parapet, is to be admired. And so to our next speaker, who also never imagined that he would be standing for public office to go to Brussels. Never imagined it, frankly never really wanted it, but he likewise was enraged by this betrayal of democracy. His career, he originally trained in the world of medicine, and he's been a passionate 
proponent of healthcare, in particular for children. Who here remembers Newsround and John Craven? Hands up. Our next speaker was the first person on that programme to speak about healthcare for children. It's great to have him with us as a TV commentator. Please give a massive welcome, David Bull. Please welcome to the stage, David Bull. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Hello, my name is Dr. David Bull. I'm a medical doctor, I'm a television presenter, and I am a very passionate campaigner. Now, I spent the last 24 years fighting to improve the healthcare for everyone in this country. And I've been involved in some really, really important campaigns, such as cleaning up our filthy hospitals, making sure that we treat older people with dignity and with respect in hospitals and in care homes. I've also ensured that every child that is born in Britain is now tested for the life-threatening condition cystic fibrosis. I'm fighting so that we can stamp out HIV from this country and around the world. And I've been fighting to ensure that every single child who goes to a primary state school in this country gets one hot free school meal a day because... If you feed children properly, they can achieve to their maximum potential. And there are amazing young people out there, and they deserve all the support that we can give them. These are really important campaigns, but the campaign that we are now fighting, all of us together, is the most important campaign of my life, because we are fighting for democracy, and democracy is in trouble. There is a fundamental fragmentation, and here in the North West, AJ told you about campaigning up here, I felt it as well. Such palpable, tangible anger. People are livid, and this unites people across the political spectrum. And why are people angry? Well, people are angry because they voted and no one is listening to what the people, what all of us here have said. I hear Ramonas all the time. I've been approached by Ramonas saying, well, you didn't know what you were voting for, did you? We did know. Did you know? Yeah. Yes, we did. We were leaving the EU, we were leaving the single market, and we were leaving the customs union. And what's more, politicians on every side said they would respect the result of that referendum. So what happened? Well, we had the largest ever democratic vote. 17.4 million people voted to leave, over 17% turnout, and 3.5 million people voted to leave here in the North. West. And the MPs then went on to trigger Article 50, setting in motion a chain of events, meaning that we were leaving the European Union. I thought we were leaving. Did you think we were leaving? Yes. yes, we want to leave, we voted to leave, and we expect to leave the European Union. Do you know, since then, there's been absolutely nothing going on. Three deals that Theresa May has brought forward. She's about to bring forward another one. The Conservatives are in disarray. Labour is in disarray. We're going to see a terrible deal try to come through the House of Commons once again. And the campaign is now getting very vicious indeed because the opposition are worried. They are throwing around slurs. They're throwing around intimidation. And the one, as a doctor, that worries me the most is I hear here time and time again, well, there won't be any medicines, the hospitals won't function. It is nonsense and it is dangerous and it mustn't carry on.
it is very straightforward why we already trade with Europe. It's not that difficult to do a trade deal with Europe. We also have major pharmaceutical companies in this country. And I'll tell you what, if Europe doesn't want to play ball, we'll take our ball and we'll trade with the United States, with Israel and with Switzerland. In closing, fundamentally, this is about democracy. The United Kingdom is meant to be the mother of all democracies, and right now we are a laughing stock around the world. On Thursday, this is a very pivotal moment in British politics. This is the moment when your voices are going to be heard, when you send politicians in the EU and Westminster an extremely powerful message that we will be listened to. This is where we change politics for good. We are fighting for a free, independent, self-governing country, and with your help, we will win. Once again, you can see the breadth and experience and wisdom from someone like David as well as AJ. His campaigning experience, his knowledge of these sectors is truly fantastic and a great asset to the Brexit party. We're very lucky to have such wisdom across so many candidates. It really is incredible. And so, ladies and gentlemen, our final speaker needs a little introduction, but <laughs> But it is worth just reminding ourselves what he has achieved. He has spent over 25 years battling, fighting for the cause of Brexit. He was the original Brexiteer. With incredible courage and bravery, fighting against the abuse, the vitriol, the threats to his family and to his own security. And we saw it again tragically today. You know, it's just unbelievable, Shame. the behaviour. It is disgusting, as you say, sir. It's absolutely shameful that we cannot properly practise free speech in the United Kingdom. It's unbelievable. We have a huge amount to thank probably the man who's had the most influence on British politics in the last 50 or 60 years. Before we welcome Nigel to the stage, let's just remind ourselves of him in action on the video. We have a parliament that is now completely out of touch with our country. I think politics is broken. Our task and our mission is to change politics for good. The Brexit Party has been formed because, very simply, the government and parliament do not wish to deliver Brexit. We are fighting back. The whole of our politics needs changing. The two-party system doesn't work anymore. If they thought we were going to give up, they've got another thing coming. This country needs the Brexit Party, and the Brexit Party needs you. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage. Nigel Farage. say it, it could be a load of old rubbish, couldn't it? Wait till the end! Do you know? <laughs> we launched the Brexit party just five and a half weeks ago. I hope you agree with me, we've made a pretty good start.
and boy did it need to be done. We won that referendum fair and square. We won it by a majority of 1.3 million votes and we were told, we were told by everybody, including that leaflet that David Cameron put through all of our doors, do you remember? Do you remember David Cameron? <laughs> Only just. That leaflet from the government made it clear your wishes will be implemented. It was clear, wasn't it? And then, a year later, there was a general election in June 17, in which both the Labour Party and the Conservative Party said, vote for us and we will implement Brexit. We then, of course, we then, of course, I can deal with the hecklers, don't you worry. <laughs> We then, of course, had Article 50 voted through by 500 MPs and it became the law of this land that we would leave the European Union on March... 20. You're awake, thank God for that. <laughs> we would leave the European Union on March the 29th with or without a withdrawal agreement. They're warming up now, Chairman. I mean, I mean, in fact, they could even recite the rest of the speech, probably. And it hasn't happened. And it hasn't happened because right from the very start, a very significant number of people in public life in this country have disrespected the will of the people, have betrayed the greatest democratic exercise in the history of our nation. And I, having spent 25 years fighting to get that referendum and to help to win that referendum, I was not going to be rolled over by these people. I decided I was going to fight back. That is why I founded this party. <laughs> now, in a previous campaign back in 2014, when I led another party to some success, I remember the vicious nature of the media attacks. I was reading an alternative CV for myself almost every day <laughs> in some of the newspapers. I have to say, I wish some of it was true. Life really would be fun. But anyway, <laughs> you liked it. <laughs> but I remember feeling pretty browbeaten at the time. I'd not been through the mill, perhaps quite in that way. And there was one thing in that campaign that inspired me. I got a letter addressed to me, opened it up, and it was in very spidery handwriting. And the author of the letter said, Dear Mr Farage, during the war, I served in Bomber Command on many missions over occupied Europe. He said, I can tell you, you only start getting flack when you're getting near the target. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and how right he was. And I realized, I've realized over the last few days that the UK political establishment aren't scared of us. They're absolutely terrified of us. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It started off with an attack from Mrs May. Well, you know. It, I wasn't too wounded by that, I can tell you. <laughs> at the launch of her European election campaign. Did you see it? There she was, with four candidates on the stage, all of whom looked as though they'd been taken hostage to appear with her. Although, although to be fair, no, no, to be fair, Mrs May is very good when it comes to ransom demands. <laughs> because she's paid a 39 billion one to Michelle Barnier and when we leave on WTO, we won't give them a penny, all right?
Then we saw Mr. Corbyn's attempt to attack me. Jeremy looking very much like he didn't want to be there particularly. Who, in his interview yesterday with that brilliant... Oh no, come on! Absolutely brilliant BBC journalist, utterly neutral at all times. Treats every guest the same way. That's right, Andrew Mars, his name. Seven times, seven times Corbyn couldn't answer what Labour's actual policy officially was on Brexit. And they say we haven't got a manifesto. You couldn't make it up, could you, really? <laughs> Corbyn attacked me saying that Nigel Farage has spent the entire campaign attacking immigrants and EU nationals living in Britain. I haven't, asked, I haven't uttered a word on the subject at any stage of it. But it shows an increasing sign of desperation. But we really, we really saw today what the establishment's real game was when out was wheeled. Gordon Brown. And Gordon Brown, Gordon Brown has accused the Brexit party of, of, of actually potential financial impropriety. Yeah. This from the man who sold 400 metric tons of gold at 280 bucks an ounce. But more seriously, this from the man who was Chancellor of the Exchequer at a time when Lord Levy was Labour's chief fundraiser and when, shall I say, an astonishing number of large Labour donors finished up in the House of Lords. And he has the front to attack us for being a grassroots organisation that have asked people to become registered subscribers to our party and to pay their £25. I wonder how many of you in this room are registered supporters of the Brexit party? Thank you, thank you. Are you watching, Mr. Brown, conspiracy theorists on The Guardian and wherever else they may be? We have raised over two and a half million pounds on our website and these are the people that have done it. But it gets even worse than being attacked in a very coordinated plan between Gordon Brown and media organisations this morning because this afternoon the Electoral Commission popped their head up. We, we went to the Electoral Commission last week to show them the checks and methods that we have in place to make sure that donations to this party are legal and absolutely in line with the law. They gave us a clean bill of health. And one of our lawyers asked them, would they please put that in writing? Which they didn't do. And so what happens on the same day? When the early morning headlines on the Beeb are that Gordon Brown will give this speech, Brown accuses us of potential impropriety, and then at 1.52, a press release from that organ of government and the state, the Electoral Commission, saying they're going in tomorrow to the Brexit Party's offices to investigate. They are doing so, they are doing so, on the basis of absolutely no evidence at all. They are doing so in an act of bad faith against what they told us to our faces last week. They are directly politically interfering in a national election in this country. It's a disgrace. It is a disgrace. 
And I want to say one other thing, please, if I can, and that is about some of the conduct and the behaviour that we are seeing on the streets of our country today. Yeah. I, won't even, I won't even acknowledge the low-grade behaviour that I was subjected to this morning. I won't dignify it. I will ignore it. Perhaps keep buying new clothes and carry on, all right? <laughs> But let me say this, for a civilised democratic nation to function, in democracy, the loser has to give their consent. The loser has to accept they've lost the election and do their best to win the next election. That is how our system works. If the loser doesn't give consent, then the whole democratic process, the, the effect of an election being like a safety valve, is lost. And what we have seen in this country since that referendum are very, very senior members of public life in this country. Former Prime Ministers like Blair, Johnny Major, uh, but even the leaders today, you know, Vince Cable, leading the Liberal Democrats, senior public figures in this country do not accept the result of the greatest democratic exercise in the history of our nation. They have done and they will do all that they can to stop it, to cancel it, to force us to vote again. They have given the impression that their view has a moral superiority over our view. They are better people than us because we, no, no, don't forget they tell us over and over and over that we didn't know what we voted for. I mean, the sheer arrogance of it, but the serious point is this, that in doing so, they have radicalized, albeit a small number, but they've radicalized a group of people in this country who themselves believe that they have a superior view to the majority. And when you have that mindset, if you believe that you are better than other people, history shows that in those circumstances, people are capable of appalling behavior. And we are now seeing the extremes of the Remain campaign acting in an openly abusive way to ordinary members of the public who dare to say they support Brexit, acting in a violent way. Do you know, we even had in Wales last week people lying in the road to try and stop cars coming in to our public event. They are trying to close down democracy. And the point is this, that when democracy breaks down, civility breaks down and that is where we are in our country today and that makes me want to redouble all of my thoughts and efforts not just into this campaign but into what comes after this campaign above all we are fighting this european election on the key issue of democracy if we don't implement the will of the people if our main parties don't keep absolutely fundamental promises made, then we cease to be a functioning democratic nation. Us, who for 800 years have had a form of parliamentary government. Us, the home to the mother of parliaments that has exported this model to the rest of the world. So what is at stake in this election is the very principle of democracy itself. And those who are fighting against us even want to stop us from saying those words. And I suggest to you that when we think about our nation, where it's come from, the incredible sacrifices people made in the past to ensure that we could be free and the type of country that we want to hand on. I suggest that we redouble our efforts. And in terms of changing politics, well, look, it is clear to me that the two-party system 
now serves nothing but itself and it's time it was challenged openly and publicly and the Brexit party will do it and this Thursday is the first step in an attempt to begin a process to change politics for good. We need to look at the party system. We need to look at the voting system. We need to look at the House of Lords. Yeah. Filled up with 700 of Blair and Cameron's mates. We need to look at the Electoral Commission. Yeah. Every single one of whom sits on the board is a, you'd never guess it, would you, Remainer. <laughs> We need to get the institutions of Westminster. What goes on in SW1 now needs to be representative of what our country is as a whole. So I'm asking people to go out on Thursday, vote for the Brexit party, give us a win. But perhaps even try and give us a big win. Because if we get a big win, all of those constantly whinging and whining on about a second referendum, all of them, Lord Heseltine, right the way through, oh my favourite, oh no my favourite, how about this, I need cheering up after the day I've had, Anna Subri. I promised the chairman this was going to be my, my most serious speech of the campaign. I'm struggling. <laughs> if the Brexit party wins big on Thursday, there will be no second referendum. They'd be too frightened to hold it. What a good reason to go out and vote Brexit on yeah! Thursday. If you vote, if you vote in big numbers for the Brexit party on Thursday, we will put back on the table that which Parliament took away, the key negotiating tool in any business negotiation. If Brexit win on Thursday, a clean break, WTO Brexit will be back on the table for the 31st of October. And we demand, we demand if we win these elections on Thursday, that we become part, with a democratic mandate, that we become part of the government's negotiating team to take us out and to make sure that the 31st of October is our Independence Day. And we demand to be a part of that. We really do. And the, the bonus ball, if you like, the icing on the cake is if you vote Brexit Party in big numbers on Thursday, if the Conservative vote gets obliterated, then we'll see the end of the worst and most duplicitous Prime Minister since Lord North lost the Americas and May will be gone! How about that? You know, perhaps the most remarkable thing about this five and a half weeks is that I know there are many countless millions of people out there, like myself, who have been enraged, upset, frustrated, angry by the shenanigans we've seen over the last three years. And yet, at every one of these meetings, when people leave here, they're no longer angry, they're actually uplifted. This party, this message is giving people hope. It's making them feel good. It's making them realise. It's making them realise that in the end, if enough of us are prepared to stand up and fight for what is right, and even though 
we shouldn't even need to be here, we know in our hearts that the majority is with us. It's not with career politics. It's not with big business. Help us make this first big step back to us becoming a true, democratic, independent nation. Go out on Thursday and help us. Let me ask you, are you with us? Yeah. Thank you very much. The training's paying off. He's back with a vengeance. And we've just got time for, uh, for three questions. And uh, to give Nigel a quick breather, the first one is uh, from Jeff from Bolton. After we win the European elections, what next for the party? Well, two weeks after the European elections, we've got a by-election in Peterborough. And we've got a fantastic local entrepreneur there who is doing great things, well known in Peterborough, and we are giving that our very, very best shot. It's an absolute outrage how that by-election was called from the Labour candidate who ended up in prison and yet was still allowed to vote in the House of Commons with a tag on her foot. Absolute outrage. So we're going to give that our very best shot. We've also, ladies and gentlemen, we've opened on our website applications for parliamentary candidates. So we're receiving applications because we, we plan to fight the next general election with candidates around the country. Because, because what we know, we know that there are competent, capable, successful people out there from all walks of life who, like us, have said, enough is enough. I need to get involved. I need to help run and govern this country properly for the people. It's a huge opportunity, and we mean to take it. Quite right. So, A question, Michael from Lee, and I think Nigel might enjoy this question. Um, when you stand up in the European Parliament for the first time in a few weeks, what do you intend to say? Oh. <laughs> well, now that would be that would be giving the game away. But over my 20 years there, I have to say. Um, I've, I've always got in there um, and tried to make very helpful and constructive comments um, in the chamber. I think I've enjoyed it more than they have. But my favourite one, my favourite one wasn't the Van Rompuy speech. It was three days after the referendum, emergency session of the European Parliament, and old Juncker, of course, kicked off. Um, lucky it was before lunch in his case. Um, <laughs> I mean, possibly mine too, you know, but, but um, you know, Juncker kicked off and everyone spoke and it, they were all very, very down and very depressed about Brexit. And then it was my turn to speak and I thought, well, do you know what? I think that for the first time ever, today, they're going to treat me with respect. That's what I thought. <laughs> Just shows you how stupid you can be, doesn't it, really? <laughs> so I got up and 400 of them started booing. <laughs> And I thought, right, you're going to get it today. <laughs> and the line I enjoyed the most of all was when I said, I came to this place 17 and a half years ago, and I said to you, I would spearhead a campaign to take Britain out of the European Union. And you all laughed at me. Well, I said, you're not laughing now, are you? <laughs> So, uh, last question. Dot from Bolton asks Nigel, what happens if the MPs do a dodgy deal and May's deal does go through? 
look, it's not May's deal, it's an international treaty, all right? That's what she wants the Commons to sign up to, a legally binding international treaty that in many ways is even worse than the current terms of EU membership. It isn't just the worst deal in history, it's a document that is so shameful, so humiliating to our nation, it would normally only be signed by a nation that had been defeated in war. That is what this woman has done to our country, and that is one of the reasons we're here fighting back today. All right? There is a, there is a school of thought, there's a school of thought that Conservative MPs are now Labour MPs, because we're now tearing chunks out of the Labour Party here in the North, and in South Wales, we've got the Labour Party absolutely on the run. But I... So there is a school of thought that says, oh, they'll all sign up to Mrs May's treaty with an add-on of a permanent customs union and single market rules because they're so scared of the Brexit party. Believe you me, if they commit that final act of betrayal, far from it being bad for the Brexit party, it'll put us in a position to perhaps win the next general election. <laughs> Brexit party on May the 23rd and let's change politics for good.